We have a special group of youngsters uh, from the high school program uh, that are part of our Epic Academy that are doing some special work uh, on the Discovery Challenge uh, Academy uh, in the working with the San Joaquin County Office of Ed. I volunteered to come to Discovery Challenge Academy and earn 65 credits and return to my high school. This is a quasi-military academy, which means we wake up at 5, 4 a.m., make our beds in 10 minutes, get dressed, go to chow, go to school, do PT, go back to chow, personal time, homework, and then it's lights out. So after I, discover, I graduate from Discovery Challenge Academy, I plan to possibly look into either the military or attend a art college called FIDM, F-I-D-M, somewhere in San Jose. Hello, my name is Kade Sanchez, and I'm here in DCA, where you get your 65 credits and graduate from high school, or early graduate. And I'm here to graduate high school, and basically every morning, we wake up at five in the morning, I aim in the morning, I mean, go to, go to ch uh, chow, after that go to school, and after school we do PT, which is we do running, push-up, sit-ups, like that stuff. Hello, I'm Cadet Clay, reporting from DCA, and I'm just here to tell you that DCA is completely voluntary to get your high school credits if you want to receive your diploma from here, as I am. Um, it's completely quasi-military. It helps you, you know, learn discipline. It helps you have a set schedule for yourself during the day. We go through making our lunch in the morning. We're going to chow, PT, DNC, um, a lot of cardio, and then of course school. And then I'm still unsure of what I want to do. Um, in our four months of being here, but hopefully within those four months, I'll be able to know exactly what I'm going to do when I get out of here. I'm um, Cadet Willis. I came to, I volunteered to Discovery Challenge Academy to earn my 65 credits and graduate with my high school diploma. Discovery Challenge Academy is a quasi-military academy where we wake up at 4 to 5 in the morning, we go to chow, we go to school, do homework, PT, um, and uh, we have personal time. We do and go to chow, and after that, we have personal time and letter writing time, and we also receive mail, and then it slides out. I plan to get higher self-esteem, better traits to become successful in my life, and be, um, build discipline into myself. And after this academy, I plan to join Jobs Challenge Academy in LA to the nursing course and get my CNA from there. Every year, it's $25,000 for the Discovery Challenge Award Fund. They're about halfway. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Any other comments about Challenge Academy? Nope. Just a very good, very good program. I think it's really good. Okay, roll call, please. Ann Bonilla. Absent. Colin Clements. Here. Sharon Lampel. Here. Stephanie Olson. Here. David Pombo. Here. Sanita Jithendra. Here. Okay, are there any uh, changes or corrections to the agenda? There are none. Move to approve the agenda. Second. Oh, <laughs> these guys are fast. Okay, by motion. Any other comments? On a motion by Trustee Clements and seconded by Trustee Olson, 
Student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with five ayes. <coughs> committee reports. The District Advisory Committee met earlier this evening and we had, um, we reviewed the LCAP goals, the learning continuity plan that replaced the LCAP during the pandemic and ended the meeting with a brief budget overview. And anyone who's interested in seeing that presentation, it will be on the district website. District English Language Advisory Committee. Trustee Bonilla is not is absent tonight. Trustee Clements? Um, yes, our next meeting will be virtual on April 14th at 6.30. Thank you. Education Committee, Trustee Olson? Nothing to report. Okay. Facilities Committee, Trustee Clements? Nothing to report. Okay. Policy Committee, um, Trustee Clements? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready for that one. Um, <laughs> We're, um, I, 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 we have the first read of a series, and I think that's all that we have in our pipeline right now. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the, the left field there. <laughs> Safety committee, Trustee Pombo? Yes, um, we have the first read of the LUSD safe schools and school site safety plans on this evening's agenda. Thank you. And the Wellness Committee, Trustee Pombo? Yep. The Wellness Committee, we also have the first read of the LUSD Wellness Plan on this evening's agenda. Thank you. Moving on to Governing Board reports. Student Trustee Member Jathendra? Um, we just had ASB and class officer elections, so we're all set for next year. And currently we're reviewing leadership elections. Um, sorry, not elections, applications. So students are signing up for that. And um, I know we started sports, or we're starting at the end of this month, and I know a lot of my peers are really excited about that. Um, yeah, that's all for my report. Okay, thank you. Trustee Pombo? Yes, um, I attended the Mountain House High School Glee virtual concert. There were some val very talented students on the, uh, on the Zoom there, um, I also participated in the Limersville School Foundation online, online auction and was lucky enough to win several class baskets. I, along with the majority of the LUSD staff, got my first dose of the corona vaccine at a very well-run clinic at SJCOE in Stockton, and we'll be getting my second dose in a couple of weeks. I also attended a public gathering at Lammersville Elementary School to address the concerns of the school and the community with truck traffic on Hanson and Von Sosten roads. In attendance were Supervisor Robert Rickman, representatives from CHP, Tracy PD, San Joaquin County, and City of Tracy. They presented possible solutions to the problem and were very, um, willing to listen to suggestions and complaints from the community. And that concludes my report. Thank you. I did have a list of the order. Uh, Trustee Olson. I attended the Lady Mustangs tennis match on Monday, February 22nd against Bayer High School. And it was great to see sports resume for our students. and. It was wonderful to watch um, the Lady Mustangs play. They won decisively, 9-0. Their sets were won decisively, and um, I, I hear that they've continued to do that as the weeks have progressed. Um, I also watched the Mountain House Glee Club virtual show online and was impressed with the talent and also loved to see how each student's personality came out in their song selections, which um, was very uh, diverse, with, and that was, that was wonderful. And uh, last week, February 22nd through 26th, I judged the YFL State Qualifier Speech and Debate Tournament as a, as a judge for Mountain House High School. And I was able to judge asynchronous and live events, and I got to judge both speech and debate. And since I was judging one of the final rounds on Saturday, they invited me to watch the award ceremony, virtual again. And it was wonderful to hear so many Mountain House High School student names called, several in first place. We had many students qualify for the state tournament and I'm excited to hear how they do there. And I was, I was blown away uh, as, a, as a 
past debater, I'm glad I do not have to debate in this day and age. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I also attempted to bid on the LSF virtual auction item and I got distracted by something at home and forgot to recheck my email and so I will have to make that up to them somewhere else, <laughs> somehow else. And uh, to conclude my report, I just wanted to say that I'm completing my homework for my first master's in governance course next Monday. Okay. That's great. Trustee Clements? Um, yes, I along with Many of my peers had my first COVID vaccine shot last Wednesday evening. Um, and the next one is unfortunately right before the next school board meeting. They, they schedule it for me. Um, I believe that I will be here on time. I will be here as quickly as I can afterwards. I did wanna say thank you to the county staff for going the extra mile and putting on, I mean, the throughput that they are getting in and out is just fantastic and I know by the time I was there at 5.30, they'd been on their feet for a very long time. And they had great attitude, uh, very helpful, um, getting everybody in and out quickly but safely, just a great job. Um, I also had the honor and privilege of judging a few sections at the state competition for DECA. Um, and when you judge that much, you can't help but judge some mountain house competitors um, uh, the, the, com the level of competition at high school, um, DECA and s debate and forensics is just unbelievable. Um, just some of the presentations that these kids did were just unbelievable. Um, and I do, um, wish Mountain House the very best. I hope that we we qualify because um, the, the winners at the state level get to compete in DECA's international competition. And that's the next step. So go Mountain House. That's the end of my report, Madam President. Thank you. I also participated in the COVID vaccine, the first shot at San Joaquin County Office of Ed. And I so agree with everything that my colleagues up here have said. It was so organized. They were so friendly and helpful and positive attitudes and it, it was amazing. It was, it, it was a well-oiled machine. I was very impressed. Um, I attended the Altamont parent meeting for safety protocols for middle schoolers before they returned to campus for the first time in 11 months. This session was a follow-up to a video that Principal Bogle had sent to the parents and was set up as a question and answer time. Parents had a few questions that were addressed and they were excited that their kids were returning to school. That same evening, Mountain House High School Glee Club entertained us with their post-Valentine virtual performance. What a great job the students did. Even when they had computer glitches, they fixed it themselves. They figured it out and they moved on. Uh, we already know how much talent is fostered at our high school and it was great for the students to be able to perform under the current virtual circumstances. Our tennis and golf teams are off to a great start. I had the pleasure of seeing the girls tennis two days after Trustee Olson. Uh, they're doing a great job. I contacted uh, Coach Sue this afternoon to find out how they're doing, and they have swept all five matches, so they are a strong 5-0 and right now with their matches. Our speech and debate team is also performing as usual, attending several competitions that so far warrant some special mention. Anaya Damala placed second overall and achieved special distinction. Vishnu Mata placed third in one competition and was a semifinalist in another. <coughs> Saksham Madnan achieved superior distinction and Elizabeth Sue achieved outstanding distinction. I know there were more, but these were the only ones that I had the information on. So great work to those students. On February 22nd, I visited Cuesta to see the middle schoolers on their first day. You never would have known these students had been out of school for 11 months. It was down to business, building on lessons from their virtual schooling the week before, not a beat was missed. They just kept going on and the teachers were excited that they were there and you could tell the kids were happy to be in school. I also attended the Wickland ELAC. Vice Principal Kareem offered parents a great deal of information regarding our English learner plans and the reclassification process. The parents appreciated the information. Last night, we had a two by two by two meeting with the Community Services District General Manager, Steve Pinkerton, 
President Andy Sue and Vice President Manny Moreno from the Mountain House CSD. They shared a great deal of information regarding current projects and future development. We shared how these projects affect the schools and our current plans for Evelyn Costa School. At our last board meeting, we authorized the district to make a $5,000 donation in order to help keep the D.A.R.E. program running uh, through this pandemic. We received the following thank you letter from the Tracy D.A.R.E. program president. Dear Board of Trustees, on behalf of the directors of the Tracy D.A.R.E. program, Inc., thank you very much for your generous donation of $5,000. These funds will help us sustain the D.A.R.E. program in the Lammersville School District for the 21-22 school year. This year, due to COVID, we have been limited on raising the funds necessary to provide the program. Thankfully, your contribution and the contributions of some other organizations, the program will continue. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at our D.A.R.E. celebrations in the future. And it is signed by Bob Haupt. I, am I pronouncing that right? I believe it's Haupt, Haupt, Bob Haupt. And he is the president of the Tracy D.A.R.E. Foundation. So I wanted to uh, quickly read that to the board members. And that ends my board report. Um, moving on super, to public comment. Superintendent Nicholas, do we have any public comment? There are none. Thank you. Moving on to consent items for consideration. We have governing board meeting minutes, contracts under $50,000, ratification of 2020-2021 new hires, ratification of resignations, Approval of early high school graduation or reduction of graduation requirements petitions, updated 2020-2021 fundraisers, and acceptance of donation. Is there any item or items that any of the board members would like to discuss or pull from consent? No. Okay, then move. I will entertain move. a motion. Move to approve consent items. Second. Okay, on a motion by Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Olson. Student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries with five ayes. And hires. Okay, we would like to welcome Maria Flores, a new instructional aide, and Luis Solorio, a new elementary K-8 custodian. Welcome to our Lammersville family, to those new employees. <laughs> District administrative reports. Superintendent Nicholas. Uh, yes, Madam President, I have a, a few important things to share. Uh, the first is a, an interesting tidbit uh, that was shared with me. Uh, uh, the Learning Council, which is a natural, national uh, digital-based educational organization um, uh, held a uh, virtual presentation nationally and our very own assistant superintendent um, Heather Sherburn aka the Sherburnator made a presentation and so good and well received was the uh, presentation that she has been um, become a factoid and a face uh, to the to the country of people interested in the Learning Council's uh, information related to data and technology so Congratulations to all of us. We want to get our name out there. And uh, uh, we unleashed the Sherbinator nationally as of last month. So um, that's always exciting. Second thing I wanted to cover is uh, we have a lot of, lot of moving parts going on right now. And um, I have a couple of pictures to share with you. And um, just to kind of give you an update, uh, it sets the stage for my kind of big picture, thousand foot view, and then uh, assistant, our associate superintendent Harrison is gonna get into uh, more details that related to the sports because they're pending. Our, our tennis team is clearly dominating, um, but we wanna get everybody uh, updated on that as well. But they all are contingent on uh, the picture uh, that you see. So if you take a look at this, you can find this on the county uh, CDPH uh, website, the public health website. Um, but there's been a precipitous drop in the, uh, the three measurements related to uh, the tier structure that gives us uh, the ability to do things with kids with more freedom uh, related to COVID safety. 
So if you take a look there, um, there's a couple of important numbers. Uh, the case rate per 100,000, the daily case rate, and the health equity number are important. So what I want to say now, because uh, Mr. Harrison is going to get into this a little bit in greater detail as well as it's a precursor, is that the, um, the case rate per 100,000 is absolutely crucial, and it has dropped to 116 uh, cases per 100,000. Um, that was, that was significantly higher just a month ago. Um, for us to go into the red tier, that has to drop down to seven. So it's dropping and dropping and dropping. The other two measurements, uh, the daily case rate and the health equity metric, are already in the red category. And in fact, the daily case rate is 0.1% from dropping to orange. So uh, what that map shows there is, is where we're at and it's important to note that one is purple, one is red, and one is 0.1% away from orange. So that's an indicator to us that the directions that we're going um, are meeting the criteria of the health standards associated with the, um, with the color scheme metrics. Um, and then uh, there was a deal made in uh, Sacramento related to two significant funding streams. Uh, one is the... Uh, in-person instruction grant, and the second one is uh, related to uh, support exp to expand learning. Uh, we call that learning mitigation loss. Um, and so the first one that's in-person instruction grants is, is related to $2 billion of Prop 98 funds that are associated with school districts that choose to go back in person. And I'll give more details in a second on that. Second one is $4.6 billion, and that is the state's effort to provide additional funds to help learning loss, to close gaps for kids, cut gaps in programs, and really trying to, to take what the distance learning, any negative impacts of distance learning, and mitigate it as quickly as possible through the 2022 year. And so, um, as a staff, we, we reviewed the deal that was made between the state legislature and the governor, and um, we feel that we are in a very good position to be able to qualify for the two funding, our, our percentile of the two funding sources. Uh, so one of the requirements is that we had to have a COVID safety plan and we submitted ours on January 29th. We, re we uh, received feedback and made any general amendments, which were all very small. Um, and that, that was already submitted. So we feel we can check that box. A uh, second, it requires that you have um, a union agreement and we have two union associations here and we have MOUs with both. Uh, related to, um, to our COVID strategies. And we uh, have a very good relationship with both. We wanna thank Nick Lanier of LTA and Erica Payne-Smith from uh, CSEA because we were able to, um, to get that, that already in place before we were asked to do so. So we can check that box. Um, we have to have uh, TK through six uh, in the hybrid mode, and one secondary school pro, uh, school grade program um, also in play, and we currently have TK-8 in play, so we've more than exceeded that, um, and we haven't even had the opportunity to open the high school yet, so we have checked that box. Um, there are testing cadence requirements, but because we opened when we chose to open um, in 2020, um, we did that bef uh, that allows that action allowed this to be this this tenant to be graduate grandfathered in. So we are not under any requirements presently, according to this agreement, to have to provide the grand scale testing that people heard about when the initial two billion dollars was announced. Um, the only time we'd have to really get into this is if there was a precipitous increase in the same vein as this drop has been, and we were to get into 25 cases per 100,000. Um, uh, but it appears at, at present we're in a good, good direction, so we don't feel like that's an imminent um, problem for us to have to address. So there's the reopening grant, and then there's the learning loss mitigation grant. So our analysis, and this is subject to change because these rules keep, keep evolving, and this is all part of legislation, and Lots of big people talking about big things and then we get told what to do. But at our base analysis of this presently is we qualify for, for our percentage proportion of both grants at present based on our analysis of, of the rules. Um, we'll have these funds through August of 2022 to expend so it's not like a rush 
if we do get the funding. Um, and on specific to the $4.6 billion um, dollar grant amount, there are some specifics in that. That 85% needs to be dedicated to um, in-person learning uh, of our proportion. And of that 85%, 10% of that needs to be dedicated to, um, to opening expenses and support of paraprofessional um, employees. And then the other 15%, which 85 plus 15 is 100, is associated with um, mitigating distance learning. So we're very excited about that. Um, so again, I want to say that with all caveats that um, if they say tomorrow that we have to jump over a rope in order to get the money, we'll ask where's the rope and how high. But at present, based on our initial analysis, we feel we've met the mark. Uh, second of all, I wanted to um, uh, piggyback on the, um, the, uh, the statements by, the, by uh, Trustee Pombo and, and Trustee Clements about the, uh, the San Joaquin County Office of Education's um, very well put together uh, uh, vaccination clinic. First is, uh, we believe that the only county in the state of California that's taken on this challenge to, to vaccinate through the County Office of Ed all educators and education professionals is San Joaquin County. Now, San Joaquin County spends a lot of time on the bottom of lists and being pointed out as uh, you know underachieving or too much poverty or too much unhealthy people. Uh, this is a, really a badge of honor for the entire county that um, you know you had well over 11,000 people vaccinated with um, a, a group of well-organized, logistics-oriented educators who really stepped up to the challenge. And um, I challenge anybody to go by and see that in action and not be impressed. Uh, so Jane Steinkamp was the lead on that. She's the assistant superintendent of curriculum and kudos go out to her and her team. And uh, Jamie Musalamis, the county superintendent of school who said, you know what, we're gonna take a risk. We're gonna take this on. And um, you know, you take a risk, you run a risk, but um, they stepped up to the plate and did good. So here's just some vaccination numbers for, for the board and the community to hear is um, a total of 685 individuals <laughs> associated with our school districts um, and who were, of adults who work with kids were invited to be vaccinated. Now, we have 548 regular employees, so we were inviting substitute teachers, walk-on coaches, a full spectrum of, of people to try to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So 685. Of that 685, 93 individuals, for their own personal reasons, chose not to become vaccinated. There were 31 individuals who had been vaccinated outside of the County Office of Education's program and 430 individuals who booked appointments from our school district and are, went, went through by, by the third today um, to become vaccinated. And then there was about 131 and we looked and most of them were folks like substitute teachers and, and people who were kind of not strangers to us but not part of the day-to-day the -day uh, scheduling uh, that didn't respond. So if you take uh, the total number vaccinated, uh, booked appointments and previously vaccinated, 461 individuals who are, work with our kids um, in this district were vaccinated. Um, so out of, of a total of 685 invited, that's 67%. That's significantly higher than um, what, what most of these programs are doing uh, that are trying to, to, to get people vaccinated. If you take the opt-out number, the 93, that's 13% of the total population. And if you just take our total regular employees and take the number of folks vaccinated, which we feel confident in saying that almost all of the people vaccinated were the regular employees, um, 548 of 685 is 84%. So somewhere in that high number, around 80% um, got vaccinated. So I think our community can feel confident that um, A, all people who work for us had an opportunity. It was clearly communicated and anybody who wanted it got the opportunity to get vaccinated. So we're very proud to be part of the county program. Um, my last two points are, um, are that the two things that we are, are in planning mode on and, and ready for action, or getting ready to be active, um, when the county becomes red, the door opens for the high school hybrid program to roll out. That doesn't mean we're waiting for it to get red and then we're gonna start getting organized. Uh, we are getting organized through the leadership of Associate Superintendent Harrison, Ben Faubert, Joni Hellstrom, their teams, our team here at the district. 
Um, so again, I'll go back to the numbers. We have one number in purple. It's 11.6. It's the cases per 100,000. It needs to be seven. We have one in red, which is the case rate per day. That's five, and it has to be less than eight. And we have to have one case, um, in, or one in, we have one in, uh, the second one in red, which is the equity number, which has to have a balance of cases in the community. And that one has to be less than eight, and it's 6.8 right now. So all total, we are prepared to go. The rule is when you get your first marker on a week of red, you have to be red that week and two weeks after. So when we get the first marker, which we almost got this week, if 11.6 had been seven, we'd be having a different conversation. Um, information and movement's gonna happen. It's gonna take us about two weeks to move that giant airplane to get ready for approximately 1,400 kids, 125 staff members. Um, but we want the teachers and all staff members have a chance to come back. We did that successfully with TK8. Um, for a week and get organized, learn all the routines, the cleaning regimens and all that. Um, and then we'll welcome the kids back. So we hope that next week we turn, get one leg into red, do two weeks after that, spring break, and we come back on fire with 1,400 hybrid kids. So 700 a day on the AB model. And then finally, um, either next board meeting or the following one, um, uh, led by Assistant Superintendent Sherburn and, and her team and, and our district leadership team, a lot of work has, been go has gone into developing a learning loss mitigation plan for summer school and summer school rolling into next school year to really take care of our youngsters uh, that are, are struggling right now or have been struggling uh, generally. And so um, all of these things are moving right now and all of it is contingent on a color scheme of purple, red, orange, or yellow and case rates going down and vaccines going out. And so uh, Mr. Harrison is really gonna hit two other very key important points tonight about sports and the graduation date because all of these factors affect all of these things. And Madam President, that is my uh, presentation. Thank you. Oh, you know what? Would you hit that one other one? And just for the board's uh, information, mm -hmm. uh, we are a donut hole in a sea of cream. Uh, if it's cream, <laughs> uh, that means that we are, that's probably a mixed metaphor, but, but roll with me here. Um, distance learning, people who are in distance learning only are in cream in this color. If you're in light blue, that means you've gone to hybrid. And if you're in person, you're in dark blue. So you can see that in our region, and this goes all the way out to the Bay and all the way up to the Sierra Nevadas, that um, most people who are open are in hybrid. And most of the people who surround us are in distance learning. So we're ahead of the curve there as well. And that, Madam President, is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And I, I, I'd like to piggyback on what you said about, you know, our county being one of the front runners in getting our folks um, vaccinated. I know of two other counties where teachers are just told, here's where they're giving it, go take care of yourself. Um, they're not being, I mean, we were, we were coddled through it. <laughs> you know, our staff was. We were given all the information. We got emails. It was easy to register. It was easy to go. We, we made it, our staff, um, we made it able for them to go during the day. So kudos to Jane Steinkamp and her team. Again, it was absolutely incredible. Um, where am I here? District Maintenance and Operations Report. I think. Hmm? Was, there, was there more on athletic? Uh, it's on info and discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Good evening, Board President Lampell, trustees, Dr. Nicholas. I'll be presenting in lieu of uh, Mr. Legrand today. This morning, he met with the project team for our HVAC company regarding bipolar ionization units. They have stockpiled over 348 units for us once our contract is approved. They're waiting on some additional transformers. Um, Site contracts will be sent out once, if they go through the approval process tonight. Uh, and he should have an installation schedule at the end of the week as long as everything goes smoothly. Elevator testing was completed uh, this week with Mountain House, Hanson, and the district office. Uh, last Wednesday, he conducted site walks at all the sites for the solar project. They're looking at layouts for the electric, the electric connections and things of that nature. I attended three of the walks uh, to make sure that what we discussed in placement at Lammersville 
Cuesta and the high school is what was presented to the board and those are consistent. Uh, last Wednesday, the baseball netting poll started at the high school. This is an item that's been going through the facilities committee for some time. They excavated the holes, concrete was poured on Friday, went out there and looked at it, they look great. Uh, Monday, they'll be here for cleanup. Um, they measured the field uh, for the nets. They should be here in the next two weeks because the nets come separately after we've installed. Big maintenance issues since the last board meeting. The septic tank at Lammersville, uh, Mr. Legrand has had a meeting with the county environmental folks on the 25th to have preliminary talks about what the system needs to entail. Uh, they pulled out the old plans and permits from the 80s and from the 60s to verify what is currently underground at Lammersville. Uh, they advised uh, about uh, more than one tank under the ground. We thought there was one, there's two, like I said, one from the 60s, one from the 80s. Um, Larry and Ruben excavated the area to find the second tank. The engineer came out this afternoon to inspect uh, both tanks, uh, found that they were connected. Um, they are in agreement that the tanks have re uh, reached the end of cycle and they are going to need to be replaced once schools let out. The underground gas leak at Lamhurstville, the leak was found and repaired. Uh, you're, you're all aware of that. I think I brought the pipe last time at the last board meeting. Uh, PG&E came out and turned back on the gas. Uh, we've had to order a new concrete box for the valve, which was installed. Uh, they back, finished backfilling the hole tonight uh, at the school. And Larry and Ruben will repair the pavement and the concrete as needed from where the hole was dug. The underground boiler pipe at the high school, which uh, we found was leaking two weeks ago, they are bypassing the underground elbow of, of, of the leak. Uh, the walls uh, were core drilled yesterday for the new pipe. Existing pipes are being welded, uh, so the HVAC company uh, have sent out a welding crew. Um, they'll be out here tomorrow. We anticipate this will be all be repaired sometime next week, so before high school comes back to hybrid, which is good because we've got a planter box all torn up and there's some fair amount of construction going on over by the gym. There's an issue with the fire alarm at Bethany. Um, it's, the fire alarm's gone off periodically during the school day in the multi-purpose room. Uh, we have brought out the alarm company and three different techs trying to fix this uh, challenging system. We continue to work on it um, as we move throughout the weeks. Um, the principal there uh, communicates clearly with me on whether the alarm is working. As you can imagine, at school, it's kind of annoying if the alarm goes off. Uh, <laughs> the backflow at Lammersville failed its annual test, uh, so we need to get new parts for that. That'll be replaced. Work is, was completed last Saturday. The retest is this Saturday. We have a check-in with Zoom for solar next week, excuse me, in two weeks, discussing the project and next steps. The night custodian at Corda started. The night custodian at Wickland is moving through the hiring process, which is great. We still have two uh, custodian openings at the high school to fill. And we had a resignation at Hanson. So now that job is posted. The ongoing saga of positions. Any questions? Do we know if that big fire pipe, that water on the back, the, water, the one that I reported to you, did that get fixed where that leak was? Not yet. No, we're, but it's been reported and the parts are ordered, I believe. Yeah, we're, we're working on it. There's a bunch of stuff that's yeah. hitting at the same time, yes. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So moving on to action items. Item number one, we have consider approval of 2020-2021 inter and intra district transfer requests. Uh, staff report? None. None? Move, mm. to, appro move to approve 2020-2021 inter and intra district transfer requests. Second. Is that you, David? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to tell sometimes. Okay, on a motion by Trustee Olson and seconded by Trustee Pombo, student uh, provisional vote? Aye. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with five ayes. Four ayes. Oh, that's right, thank you. <laughs> Four ayes and one absent. 
Consider approval of 2021-22 inter interdistrict transfer requests. Is there a staff report? None. I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve 2021-2022 interdistrict transfer requests. Second. Okay. On a motion by Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Olson. Uh, student preferential vote? Aye. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes with four ayes and one absent. Consider approval of course outlines at Mountain House High School. Staff report? Uh, last board meeting, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Sherburn um, um, and, and the high school team have, have gone through this process to kind of systematize and clarify and clean up uh, 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 course outlines. Uh, this is approximately 30 that are coming through uh, for formal approval. Okay, and I just wanted to add to that so anyone watching the meeting knows in this, uh, these course outlines include 15 English courses, two math courses, eight science courses, eight social science courses, and 20 visual and performing arts courses. Are there any additional questions or comments? I just wanted to say that I think it's so wonderful that the high school has everything so well placed online so that students and, and you know future eighth graders can get online and look at all of the courses. Um, I think the only complaint we could say is that they're giving so many options, how do you narrow it down? <laughs> because the options are, are wonderful. <laughs> okay, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve course outlines at Mountain House High School. Second. The other trustee Pombo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, based on a motion by Trustee Olson and seconded by Trustee Clements, student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes with four ayes and one absent. Consider approval of the LUSD Board Governance Handbook. Um, staff report? Uh, yes, uh, over the course of the last couple of months, uh, the board's gone through its governance handbook and thoroughly vetted it, uh, provided updates and um, new ideas, and this is the culmination of that work for approval um, of the board. Any questions or comments about this item? Okay, I agree. It has been vetted and vetted and vetted. <laughs> <laughs> Move to approve the LUSD board governance handbook. Second. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give that one to Trustee Pombo. <laughs> okay, based on a motion by Trustee Clements and seconded by Trustee Pombo, student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with four ayes and one absent. Item E, consider approval of contract with Air System Service and Construction for $372,844.85. Uh, staff report? Uh, yes. Uh, last week, Mr. Legrand gave a thorough um, review and explanation of the ionizer, which uh, helps purify the air. Um, it will help with uh, co short-term COVID-related issues, but long-term allergies and, um, and possible smoke and other things. He also did an excellent job explaining the periodical element chart in his explanation. Uh, so we give him kudos for that. So uh, we're excited. This is going to help uh, for anybody with any breathing issues moving forward. Um, it should create created some uh, improved air. Okay. Any questions or comments by the board? I do have one question, Madam President. Um, I'm assuming that the units for the PC PDC are included in the number of units for Cordis. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Uh, sorry, former president. <laughs> I flashed back. I'm sorry. Yes, Trustee Pombo. <laughs> sorry about Wherever that. Wherever you are, the sorry. answer is the same. Sorry, current President Lampel. I apologize. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I assumed it was because that site has a dozen or so more than the other sites, and there's none listed for the PDC, but I just wanted to make sure that that was yes, the case. Thank you. Any other questions or comments by the board? Madam President, I, I do have one comment. This is an example of how school construction costs are gonna go up 
as a, as a result of COVID-19. Um, and unfortunately, we are not, there's no way we can know how much. We know it ain't going to go down. But we, you know, and, and I would just, um, I would just signpost to the developers that if you want to be annexed into the school district, we don't know how much this stuff is going to increase school construction costs, and therefore you don't know how much this is going to increase school construction costs. But the schools that meet the Division of State Architects requirements, whenever they are, that's what has to be built, period actually part of our conversation at the two by two by two meeting last night where the average cost of building a high school had gone up by how much uh, uh, there's a one in Folsom going forward for 350 million oh wow yeah. so and it's not just the COVID stuff yeah and, and ours was built by the way for approximately 150 million over two phases mm -hmm. and just to piggyback on trustee Clement's comment there's no way to know what it's going to cost, and there no, isn't even any way to know what the requirements are going to be because the state, county, and federal government keep changing the requirements for everything to do with COVID. So, buyer beware. Yeah, yeah. and we're in a, a time and situation of unknown. You know, like so much of what we've done in Lammersville, we're building the plane as we're flying it, and that's all educators nationwide probably worldwide. So I will entertain a motion. Move to approve. Okay. Move to approve contract with Air System Services and construction for $372,844.85. Second. Okay, on a motion by Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Olson. Student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries with four ayes and one absent. Information and discussion item. First reading of 2021-22 LUSD Safe Schools Plan and School Site Safety Plans. Staff report? Uh, yes, this is an annual endeavor um, uh, through our, our safety committee. Uh, this is the district safety plan and also each school site plan for the board's review. Any questions or comments? I do have a comment, Madam President. Um, I would like to thank the committee, especially Associate Superintendent Harrison and Director Busatil for all their work on this, this endeavor. I would also like to thank former Trustee Balzarini, who was a big part in the development of the safety po protocols here in LUSD. Yeah, I, I recently moved, uh, joined the safety committee and just the two meetings I've attended, the work is, is so thorough and I, I feel great about these plans going forward. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I would just like to echo what, what Trustee Pombo said. Um, I, I remember when I was a parent attending one of the safety committee meetings headed up by trust, then Trustee Balzarini and I was, I was very grateful that he had such a vision for safety in our district and I, I, I sit on the high school safety committee and, and, and the work that they put into it and the thought they put into it, um, especially with respect to the COVID part of the safety plan is, mm -hmm. is um, very meticulous. And, and I'm, I'm grateful that the safety of our students is taken into such um, consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that will come back for final approval at our next meeting? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, First reading of the 2021-22 LUSD wellness plan. Staff report? Yes, again, an, an annual endeavor. Um, we have a wellness uh, committee in the same light as the safety committee. Um, and, and this is the wellness plan for the district for the first perusal of the board. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments from the board? I have the uh, same comment, Madam President. I would like to thank the committee, especially Associate Superintendent Harrison and Director Busatil for their hard work that went into these plans. I would also like to thank the school site councils and safety committees and wellness committees at each site for the work that they put into both of these, all of these plans. Any other comments or questions? Just, I regret that it's uh, not completely in person this year because uh, the wellness committee's farmers market is such a wonderful program yeah. and and I look forward to seeing that back in in play. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, moving on to item C, high school graduation date, staff report. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Associate Superintendent Harrison is going to present um, the, the, the date, uh, but more important, the, the importance of choosing a date now. Um, and then the next item is also about the sports guidance, so he's going to um, hit the next two. Board President Lampell, <laughs> trustees, Dr. Nicholas, thank you once again. Um, so uh, we just wanted to bring forward the high school graduation date of June 4th and reaffirm and solidify that for this coming uh, end of the school year. Because as you're all aware, last year our graduation date passed and the date passed again. And we ended up in later August having a, a ceremony, which was great for what we could do at the time. But um, at this juncture, the high school staff, some of the uh, teachers at, this, uh, at the high school, and to be quite honest, we're getting some phone calls from parents and some communication from students wanting to know, hey, is our date solid this year? And our recommendation is in order to backwards plan from the high school graduation date for our promotions and to plan forward for summer school, we really think we ought to hold firm on that date and plan the graduation according to whatever tier we're in. Now we have positive thoughts about the tiers changing by the time we get there, but um, if we solidify the date, my plan is to have the high school develop a plan for each tier so that we know and parents know exactly what's going to happen with graduation depending on the tier that we are in and that they know that is going to be our date for graduation, June 4th. I think that's a great idea. Yep. You know, and I, for one, am in favor of doing whatever, the, whatever we can do to, to have the most normal graduation that we can possibly have for our, our families and our students because although last year was it was great what we did I felt bad for those kids and those families that that's the best we could do mm -hmm. I agree and and especially this year th our seniors haven't set foot in school this year seniors haven't set foot inside their school once and they've missed out on so much so whatever we can do um, to not have just a drive-by <laughs> graduation regardless the tier I think would be very meaningful for them so as, as I understand it, the, the implications of this ask and consensus are we're going to hold firm on the date. And whatever we are allowed to do on that date is what we will do. So when certain members of the public say, gee, if we just postpone it another three weeks, we'll be into this other tier, the answer is going to be, okay, last year we tried it this way. And there were positives and negatives to, you know, of waiting and, ho and being hopeful. And this year, in order to enable students and parents and staff to plan, we're holding the date firm and we're going to do the best graduation ceremony we can on that date. And if I could just add, summer school is more crucial this summer than any other summer. Amen. And, and uh, we're, uh, when you see the expanded plans for summer school, um, this is a very, very important thing for high school seniors in their transition to adulthood. But there's a, a lot of people affected and kids affected into next school year, and that's why the firm date is also important. So neither, do you have any comments on this? I just think that last year my sister graduated, and I know her and her class were not very... Well, they enjoyed the drive-by, but I know they weren't very happy with just the drive-by. So I think for this year, we should be extra prepared mm -hmm. and give class of 2021 like whatever we can. Yeah, I think it's a great to hold firm on the date. Like Trustee uh, Clement said, let the parents know. Will this also reflect on the Thursday promotion ceremony for the eighth grade? And we're going to hold solid on that. The idea is we set this date and then we'll backwards map from the Friday backwards with what we can do with the K-8 schools. And we're working on a plan for that to bring to the board as well. Uh, that may have some modifications to some, some slight changes. Okay, because pre-COVID, we spent a lot of time talking mm -hmm. about the issue of when the promotion ceremony is and when the graduation is and went back and forth and we came up with a firm decision and I, I hope we can stick to that. I would just like to respond to um, Sunita's comment, and that would just be that nobody was really happy with the drive-through yeah. graduation. It was the best we could we could do, and 
it's unfortunate, but I'm hoping we can do a lot better for this year's graduating class. Yeah. So neither the district where I was working last year, they came in, they walked across the stage, they did it one at a time. It took three days. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's a much so, smaller high school, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it is a much smaller high school. So hopefully we'll be able to have something. We'll be in a tier that will enable us to uh, have something special for our kids. Yeah. Okay, moving on, assist, uh, Associate Superintendent, to the updated high school sports guidelines. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for having me again. Um, so I wanted to talk to uh, the board a little bit about return to high school sports. Some of this presentation will be a little bit of a review from the last time I talked about sports, but some of it's brand new and I'm really excited to come to you and talk to you about this because we've got kids coming out of their houses and participating in activities related to high school, which is really exciting for everybody, I think. Um, the first thing I'm I'm going to do, there it is, okay. <laughs> the first thing I'm going to do is talk about case rates. So widespread or purple, substantial or red, moderate or orange, minimal or yellow. I put that along the top so you can remember what the color codes mean and the public could see what the color codes mean. And I'm basically showing you here exactly what Dr. Nicholas showed you earlier, just in a different format. The adjusted case rate per 100,000 uh, currently is at 11.6 which is in the purple, I color coded the, the number so that you could see uh, what uh, color we're in. And then the positivity rate for the seven day average is currently at five, which is orange. And the health and equity quartile rating is at 6.8, which is in red. There is no purple for, the, for that rating. And as you can see, we have a little ways to go to get into red for the adjusted case rate. However, with sports, there was new criterion given to all of the school districts that said if you're between 14 and 7 uh, on your case rate as of February 28th, you could start the Tier 2 sports. So I'm going to give you a little review and then talk about that a little bit. So we had some sports start in the purple tier on February 1st. Those were the safer sports, less contact, easy, easier to control, less contact with other athletes more options for, for practicing safety precautions, face coverings and cohorts than the other sports. And that's cross country, golf, swimming, tennis, track and field. Those are currently going. I'll have more information for you at the end of my presentation based on those activities. Um, and then the additional sports were added um, as of February 26, which include baseball, softball, cheerleading, boys and girls soccer, boys and girls water polo and football. Now there are some additional safety precautions that we have to take with these activities, more so than the activities that started on February 1st. So what are the safety considerations? A, we have to have informed consent from all the parents that they're still okay with their kids participating during this tier that the CDPH put out. So right now at 11.46, uh, whatever it is currently. And um, that's besides the informed consent that we already do for the sports packet for safety for kids when they participate in sports. Everybody has to have a face covering, fans, coaches, and during play as practicable and safe. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Our league has worked on a plan for face protocols, face mask protocols. One of them is with cross country, kids will start when they're all in a group in a cross country meet. I don't know if you've been to a cross country meet, Everybody starts in a big group. So they're gonna space as much as possible, but it's a little challenging. So they start with a mask on. Once they get going, you can't run with a mask on for any length of time, right? So once they get going and they're up to speed, they pull their mask down. When they're finished and they're done, they finish with their respiration at a high rate and their heart rate at 140 or whatever, they put the mask back on, right? Or if they have to drink or whatever, they, they take the mask off, put it back on. So there's a number of safety precautions for all the different sports in relation to wearing a face covering. Baseball, softball, it's a little easier. Soccer, if your heart rate's up around 130, 140, you're not going to be able to wear a mask. Football, if you're sprinting down the field or if you're an offensive lineman, which I have experience in, and you're blocking every down, it's hard to have a mask on. You can't have a mask on and respirate and do your job. 
But when you get to the sideline, you have to have your mask on, you got to be safe on the sidelines, and you got to space as much as possible. So we'll be using those whole sidelines, right? <clears throat> Proper hygiene and sanitiz sanitization. Prior to going out, they have to sanitize their hands. When they come in, they got to sanitize their hands. Uh, we, we, we're trying to limit mixing by participants. However, CDPH and the CIF have approved that there are kids can play two sports at a time during this time. Um, I think basically because they want kids to have more opportunities. Uh, and there are travel conditions. You can only travel over a county. So if we're going to play in our league, if our league was two counties over, we could not play the team that's two counties over. All of our league is either here in this county or in Stanislaus County, so we're okay. We can travel to Stanislaus County as long as their case rate is commensurate with our case rate. There has to be an equanimity there on our case rates, okay? which we do, which is good news. The other requirement is that for football and water polo, activities that you really can't control for contact, uh, tackling, blocking, Covering, uh, covering a wide receiver or vice versa. Water polo, you know, attacking the net, shooting the ball, defense in water polo. You really can't control for a mask, wear a mask, or have that distance, the potentiality of distance. So the requirements for football and water polo are weekly uh, PCR testing. So the weekly PCR testing has to be done um, at the same time in a given week, and you have to have results within 24 hours. Now, what we've done is, is we have a contract available and ready to go for a testing company. Um, they've given us a week to week because we weren't sure the start date uh, of where we were going to start and when everything was gonna start happening. Um, and the cost of said testing, we, we got a really good deal. So we're prepared for that activity and prepared to test all of the athletes, all of the coaches, all the participants in water polo and football. There it is. Yeah, that's just weird. I don't know. Maybe the battery's dying. Uh, fans. So we have some rules with fans, and our league is making some decisions based on fans as well to have some commonality. Fans, uh, according to CDPH and the CIF, have to wear a face covering at all times. Observers must maintain a six-foot distance from non-household or family members. Now, the other thing that is, is on top of this is the league meetings. They're talking about limiting two family members per athlete in the majority of sports because of space. Tennis, there's not a lot of place on the water polo deck, on the swim deck. Uh, even in the baseball, everybody lines up behind the diamond. It's always full of people. If, I mean, if you have a good fan base like we do, they don't necessarily have that over in Stanislaus County, but we have it here. Um, they've talked about limiting to two family members. Um, so, so that's a commonality that is a safety precaution that not only follows what the CDPH guidelines are, but I think it follows it very well. Um, pretty stringent. Um, there's no mixing with other households. One of the big concerns that's written down in the plan is don't let households and families intermix after an event. After a game, a lot of times everybody comes together and, hey, good job, great job, athlete, and all these parents are all mixing, right? The coaches are going to have to say, go, go off campus, go and talk at home, phone call or whatnot. And then our indoor sports, when we can start indoor sports, they have to adhere to the CDPH gym and fitness uh, center guidance slash requirements. So when we get in red, gyms and NPRs and, and things of that nature can go to a 10% maximum capacity of the facility. When we're in orange, it's 25. When it's in yellow, it's 50. Um, so that limits basketball, volleyball, these sports that are still, we're still waiting to see if we're going to have a season, right? And then one of the other considerations is maybe video streaming for some of the, the major sports, maybe football, have some video streaming so those family members that can't come attend can see it on the video streaming, uh, which we do have that capability at the high school. We're just going to have to get it all worked out. 
Lastly, I wanted to review with you the different sports, their start dates, and how many events they're getting. We've done pretty well with getting kids a, a good number of events after what we've gone through over the last uh, six or eight months. Cross country started on February 23rd. They have six events. Track and field started on April 8th, seven events. Swimming, March 9th, nine events. Girls golf, February 18th, 11 events. Boys golf, March 29th, five events. Girls tennis, February 18th, 13 events. Boys tennis, March 23rd, 15 events. Boys and girls water polo, April 20th, nine events. Baseball, April 7th, 18 events. Softball, April 19th, 10 events. Boys soccer, April 23rd, 11 events. Girls soccer, April 23rd, 11 events. And football, March 19th, five events with a hard stop like I've presented to the board before on April 18th as a requirement for CIF. Before I conclude, I'd like to thank Lupe Galindo, who is our athletic director at the high school. He's been working long, long hours and tirelessly to get with his colleagues to uh, make sure that we are influencing our league to help ourselves uh, as well as everyone else in the league. Getting schedules, making sure coaches have done all of the required HR documents and things they need to do to be onboarded. Uh, I attended the safety meeting that the principal, the vice principal, and the athletic director had with all of the coaches. It was a great meeting. They were smart. They, they addressed everything. They came up with some things that CDPH and CF hadn't even thought of. And they were really thoughtful and doing a great job to make sure that our kids have an opportunity, but a safe opportunity to, con to continue to, uh, to, to participate in sports. So I want to thank the, the high school staff, the athletic director, the coaches who have been waiting patiently and are really excited, but they got to control themselves <laughs> to make sure right, they, they do everything right. So, so they really are asking a lot of great questions because they want to make sure they do it right. Um, and we've been very clear on the criteria. We've set it down very clearly. So um, I'm excited, if you can't tell, I'm excited that sports are back, that our kids get to do something really fun and really school-related uh, moving forward. That's my presentation. Could you please have Principal Faubert send us the dates? Because when we thought sports were going to open up earlier, we had a list of dates. So if we could get um, a new one, that would be great. I'm just as excited that the kids are out at sports. It was fabulous to get out to the, to the tennis courts. It's me out of the house. It was like, oh, I'm in the sunshine. This is great. Um, people are starting to come out of their houses. You know, I walk around town at night, and it's amazing how many people are out and walking and you know, just waving across the street. So I'm excited for the kids. I have a question and a comment. Um, uh, first, I'll just my question. With respect to water polo and football and the testing, what um, if a player tests positive on one team, does that cancel that event for that week for the whole team, or does that just put that player in quarantine? It depends. It depends on how they've cohorted and organized. We've talked at, uh, at, with the football team about strategic practices and how they structure them throughout the week, where you have cohort groups and you don't do team until you go to, until you get tested and then move team time after that because that'll protect your cohort groups. Um, but yeah, it'll knock, it could knock out all the receivers. It could knock out all the DBs. It could knock out the whole offensive and defensive line. So yeah, that's, that is a part of the consideration. On water polo, it could, it could knock out a whole team. So yes, that is, okay. yeah. And then, and then my comment, um, and it's more directed about CIF, not, I, I mean, I, I wanna make this very clear. I very much appreciate the work that you have done and, and our athletic director has done. I feel like CIF often forgets that cheer is under their jurisdiction um, and cheer um, is, is, you know, being told they can't stunt and the rationale is that, well, they don't have to stunt. And I want to point out that for cheerleaders, not stunting is like telling tackle football players, you don't get to tackle or you have to do passing only, no running backs. And so um, I know that their rationale is that, you know, that cheer doesn't technically have to do that and they can eliminate the contact. But 
in a way, it's safer for cheer to stunt than, than it would even be for tackle football or water polo because they're not playing another team. They'll never face another school's athletes. They're always just together in their cohort, and they can do it masked. And so I don't know if there's anything we can do to advocate for that, but cheer is the only sport at the high school where the parents actually pay for their daughters and sons, well, we had a few male cheerleaders, to buy the uniform. And so they've invested a lot of money. And you know, they, I think they feel like they're not getting anything. So that, that's just a comment I wanted to make, and I know that that it's on CIF's end and not yours, but. I think it's fair commentary. Yeah. I, now that you lay it out, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I was not aware of that, so thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions regarding football. Um, if someone tests positive, is there a mechanism to retest either that individual or whatever cohort they're in to see if they if that was an actual positive or just a bad test so that the and if so can the the rest of the cohort say that the person that tested positive tests positive again is there a possibility of the rest of the cohort doing further testing and being negative and being allowed to play sooner than the individual that actually tested positive. So unfortunately, we're still under the CDPH guidance. We, you know, we're not like some of the NFL and the college teams to where they structured the rules and they have medical people and they, they could do things like that. Um, I think, yes, we could give another test, uh, but if there's a positive, we have to do a 10 day quarantine. And, and it has to be from the onset of either symptoms or the positive test. So we don't have, uh, we don't have allowance to be flexible there. Um, I think the, that totally we could give another test and if there's an error in the test, we could check that. But we went with the PCR test because it's 99% um, positive, uh, correct on positives, which is a really high rate. Um, Mr. Harrison, isn't it true that too that with the 24-hour notice that Thursday would be the likely day of the of the testing? We're shooting for Thursday, yes. Yeah. So I don't know if that gives you a sufficient answer, but that's really the only information that I have at this time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if there was further clarification on the <laughs> from the CIF or the um, California Health Department. I apologize, there is not. Um, another question on football. Have we, has any talk been given of having the marching band participate in football games in any way, shape, or form? Uh, ben Fobert and I had a conversation, I think yesterday, talking about band and cheer and their participation in the variety of things that they participate in. Uh, my understanding that marching band is finished as a season, so I think that would leave percussion. And I, I think he was going to talk to the, uh, the band director and see where they are and what kind of participation. Um, if it was the marching band, we would have problems because of the woodwind. Mm. The blowing is a problem. And I don't know that we could accomplish that and follow the rules at a game. Um, percussion, I think we may be able to. But that's a conversation that we're still having. Because um, many, many, many years ago when I played high school football, the um, the band was, I thought, an important part of the games. It revved the team up. It made the crowd, which is going to be much smaller, I understand, but it made the crowd included in the game in, in a different way, and I just I think it's important if we can do it. And also to, to let those kids have an experience of being at, in the band at a football game that they haven't had in the last year. Um, one other question. I understand that some of the some of our opponents are not allowing visiting parents or fans to attend games at their places. Are we planning on allowing visiting team fans to attend here? At this juncture, I'm not aware of anyone that we play that won't allow the two the, the you know two family members. Um, to play. I, I could be corrected later on, but I, I do not believe that that's the case for us. Um, our plan is to allow both sides as long as everybody follows the rules. We have the, the two limit. Um, we're going to have signs all over with the rules wherever fans are going to be. 
And the sign's also going to say, hey, if you don't follow the rules, you're going to be asked to leave, period. There's no argument, no discussion. If you don't want to wear a mask, you're going to be asked to leave because we're going to follow the rules for the kids so they can do it. So that's where we are at this juncture. So if I understood you correctly, are you saying that at a, at a football game only the parents of a, of a player, for instance, would be able to go because that's two or is that for the other sports other than football because of these, the capacity constraints? So um, Mr. Fober and myself have discussed the stadiums. One of the problems some of the other stadiums in our league have is they're of smaller capacity. And in the league where they have more than one stadium, they're having to make rules for both stadiums. One is small, one is large. We have the largest capacity of any of them. At our home, we feel like we can include more than the two unit group and be still following the guidance of CDPH, uh, CDPH, still being safe, but allowing a few more members on our sideline. Now, I don't know that we could do that for visitors because that side is smaller. So they may have to still follow the rules they follow on their side of town or their side of the county, mm -hmm. um, which is a little desperate, but I think we have that prerogative mm -hmm. because our facility is larger uh, and we have the ability to still be safe. And, and, and that will include uh, cheer parents and, and if band or percussion plays, their parents. It, 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 exactly. And the thing is, we're going to have to trust families to stay in a family group and to be six feet apart. And all those guidelines are going to be clearly laid out in their coaches' meetings, you know, which is the first communication to the parents and the kids, and with signs on the fences and elsewhere, and communications from the principal to all parents, you've got to follow these rules. And to the athletes, you've got to follow these rules. And the coaches know. So we should have plenty of people around to reinforce and re-impress upon people. You've got to follow the rules. Or guess what? We're not going to be able to have fans, and we don't want that. And, and, and what, going on off of what Trustee Pombo was saying about schools not allowing people in, I, I had heard that as well. Uh, I, knowing uh, of the cheer program, that they were told that they could only go cheer at one away game, and they can cheer at both home games, and that the two other away games, uh, the, the away game they're allowed to cheer at is Patterson, and the other two, uh, were, they were told that they're not allowing spectators in but since uh ch since cif has approved these sports and cheer has been approved i was curious how they could deny cheer <laughs> if it goes along with football um, is that um and and can i ask you a question on that yes um so for football would that be buyer and grace davis they weren't allowed that's correct that, that's that's the information i have I want to uh, compliment uh, Associate Superintendent Harrison. Um, I understand that he has a past with uh, Modesto Unified, and I understand he expressed his opinion about some opinions expressed at that meeting that you might be hearing about. And I understand there may be some changes in people's attitude as a result of his assistance with their attitude. Is that fair to say, Mr. Harrison? Um, yes, I will have to double check that their attitude has changed towards cheer, which is a CIF sanctioned sport and activity. Um, so I will double, double check on that, but I have double checked on the other items. So I, I will double check. Thank you. You bet. It could have just been one person with a big personality expressing themselves way out of tune or way out of, what is way out of school as it were. <laughs> and in, in case you haven't noticed the, uh, the board, I think I can speak for the board on this is excited to have kids back in school and back on sports fields and back doing things that they should be, should be doing. Agreed. And, and, and I will say that uh, what you said about the marching band, I think, is important because I, I'm, I'm so excited that, you know, the students that love to do sports are getting out and doing it and that we've had virtual debate and DECA. I feel like one area that still has been really harmed from COVID is the performing arts, uh, the, the band, the orchestra, the drama. And anything we can do to give them any opportunities, I think, is is um, important too, so that you know maybe they can have a little bit of what their passion is. You, you bet. And if I could respond to that, Mr. Fober and I have been aggressively pursuing all aspects because because he and I and Dr. Nicholas, I think we all agree, we need to get our kids participating in these different activities, but safely and following the rules. 
So we check all those criteria, we check all those boxes. If we can do that, then we aggressively go after it and try to make it happen. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, great conversation. Thank you. All right, moving on to calendar. Our next board meeting is March 17th, 2021. And on our agenda, it does say virtual. Um, we will be meeting in person. Um, it is possible based on the improved COVID numbers that the county will be in the red tier or better in the next month. Uh, if so, board meetings may change to community in-person attendance with capacity limitations. And I'm struggling with this thing again. I brought it somewhere else. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, in-person attendance with capacity limitations based on social distancing rules by tier. The next two meetings are March 17th and April 21st. So we will wait and see what tier we are in if the public can come in within those, um, the, the current guidelines at the time. So we may have the public in here. Um, Wednesday, April 14th, Wellness Committee meeting will meet at 3.30 and currently scheduled to be virtual. And Thursday, April 15th, DLAC meeting, also scheduled to be virtual. Superintendent Nicholas, if we move tiers, will most meetings start to change? Uh, you know? In terms of these committee meetings, um, what we had, the board had discussed um, was that it may be uh, for certain committees that keep mm -hmm. maintaining them in a virtual format would increase the uh, attendance, attendance rate. Yeah. And so we, we heard that loud and clear, um, and so discussions are which ones would be the best uh, so we can get more folks to get okay. the information. So for now, it's just the board meetings. Correct. That if we go into those tiers, we would be able to allow um, the public in. So in a moment, we will be adjourning to closed session. In closed session, we will be, we will be considering the following items. Public employee discipline dismissal release complaint, uh, government code 54957, consider approval of leave of absence for a certificated employee and conference with real property negotiators, government code 54956.8. Move to adjourn to closed session. Second. Okay, based on a motion to um, move to closed session by uh, Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Olson, Student preferential vote? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries with four ayes and one absent. We are now in closed session. Thanks, everybody. We are reconvening from closed session at 8.54 p.m. Closed session item A, on a motion by Trustee Clements and seconded by Trustee Pombo, the board adopted a resolution pursuant to the applicable provision of education code and authorized the district superintendent and his or her designee to notify certain certificated employees of their release from his or her probationary positions by the following vote. Four ayes, zero noes, and one absent. Closed session item B, consider approval of leave of absence for certificated employee number 130053 from March 11th, 2021 through April 9th, 2021. The board took action on a motion by Trustee Olson and seconded by Trustee Clements to approve the long-term leave of absence for certificated employee 130053 from March 11th, 2021 through April 9th, 2021 by the following vote, four ayes, zero noes, one absent. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. On a motion by Trustee Pombo and seconded by Trustee Clements, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries with four ayes and one absent. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>